Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, my name is Dave Barbier. I'm the sustainability coordinator here on campus. And uh, it's my pleasure to have you all here spending your time uh, on Earth Day with us. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of brief introductions, make some housekeeping announcements, and then uh, uh, continue on with our keynote speaker. So um, first of all, uh, this is just a kickoff to Earth Week. So we've got a lot of great events planned. Uh, you can find a ton of information on our Facebook page about everything else that's going on. Uh, for those of you who might have been planning to participate in the Earth Walk at 5.30, that has been rescheduled for tomorrow due to rain. So just as an FYI uh, about that, if uh, that's something you were looking forward to after this event. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to say a couple of uh, quick thank yous and a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Chancellor Patterson and the Chancellor's Office for all the work they did in helping to coordinate this and bring Ramez here. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without the support of the their office. Also, uh, to the Earth Week Planning Committee, uh, there's students and faculty and staff who have all been engaged in that process. Uh, and we wouldn't be here without their hard work, which started last fall. So it's been a long time coming to get to this date. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited that we're getting close to the end of this date as well. Um, lastly, uh, I want to thank uh, Eric Olson for all of his hard work. He's been an active participant in our Earth Week planning ever since I got here, uh, and he's played a huge uh, role in the events of today. He, he's housed on our campus in UW Extension Lakes, but he's got a statewide um, sort of reach, so we're very fortunate that uh, he cohabits this space with us here on our campus. So uh, let's give it up for Eric, and then he'll take us away. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> no one's really here to see, hear me talk, I imagine. Um, so I'm going to try and keep it really short. One uh, group that we do also need to thank is actually at UW-Madison. At UW-Madison, just for the last, I think, uh, 18 months, they've had a, a Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. And part of what they did is they, they did create a funding opportunity for campuses outside of Madison to request funds in order to bring in speakers that maybe otherwise we wouldn't get a chance to hear. So I do have to give uh, props out to them uh, for, for funding this uh, program today. So uh, today's event is pretty much funded completely by UW-Madison. Uh, thank you, Madison. <laughs> And I also want to comment that today we did have sort of a day-long process that started with lunch, uh, working with uh, local lawmakers, some of our state lawmakers uh, made it, or one of our state lawmakers made it, Katrina Shankland. Um, we also had the new chair of the Public Service Commission, and, and we're, we're really engaging a discussion of what are the implications of what Ramez is going to present. And I do want to give a, a shout out for tomorrow at 1230. If, if after you see this, you're kind of still left scratching your head wondering, well, what is the relevance or how is this going to change my world? Come back tomorrow at 1230. Uh, we'll be back in, here in the Dreyfus University Center. And we have a panel of people, statewide energy experts, who are going to be discussing sort of what does it mean for Wisconsin when renewable energy prices are changing in this way and when battery power is changing this way. So that's just a plug. Tomorrow, 1230, back here at the Dreyfus University Center. It's going to be a great interactive sort of panel discussion about the implications here. Um, Mr. Ramez Nam, I did not know him until uh, someone with uh, the Wisconsin Conservative Energy Forum pointed out his videos online. Uh, he's been just a terrific person to work with to line this up. Uh, he does have several uh, published books out there. If you're intrigued, you can find him on Amazon. Uh, he lives in Seattle. He's coming to join us as part of, he really travels all over the world giving similar presentations. He's pretty much retired from Microsoft and does this kind of stuff. He kind of has the flexibility to do just about whatever he wants these days. So we're, we're just glad that he found his way to little old Stevens Point right here in central Wisconsin. Uh, please join me in giving a warm central Wisconsin welcome to Ramez Nam. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you Eric. And thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you, Stevens Point, and thank you, Tommy G. Thompson Center. So I'm Ramez Nam, and it's an honor to be with you uh, here today on Earth Day. And uh, I've got a confession to make. I'm an optimist. Uh, but some of these issues around climate and the state of the planet in other ways uh, stress even my optimism. So today I'm going to talk about the most optimistic facts and trends that I know, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the serious challenges that still remain, because I believe we can turn this ship, but we haven't turned it yet. 
Now, I'm a Midwestern boy, actually. I, I went to school. I grew up in St. Louis and then down to Illinois. I went to college at the University of Illinois. And, and from there, I, I studied computer science. And I had the good luck uh, to land at Microsoft uh, in 1995 and uh, do some things there. And I think one way that this influenced me in working in software and working at Microsoft is the realization that technology can change the world. And so my message here today is going to be a lot about how our ability ability to have a better Earth and a better life for the inhabitants of Earth uh, down the road is really about technology, the development of technology, and how technology can spread to all the, all the seven and a half billion people and maybe eventually nine billion people that we have on planet Earth. Nowadays, what I do is I'm the co-chair for energy and environment at a place called Singularity University. We're housed at NASA in Silicon Valley, right across the street from Google. Uh, and what we do is we talk about the use of technology. We call exponential technology, uh, things like computing, artificial intelligence, robotics. Uh, and I'm the energy guy. We talk about the use of that to solve some of humanity's grand challenges, and challenges like poverty, water, food, uh, deforestation, and uh, the climate overall, and global poverty as well. Now, I got there because in between uh, Microsoft and that, uh, I wasn't always interested in the environment. I was sort of a naive person who thought, oh, the world's getting better. Uh, technology will solve problems. And then one day, uh, I had sort of a cliche environmental awakening. I was swimming on a beautiful beach, and I had the whole day there. And I was just like, this planet's so gorgeous. And maybe I should figure out if it really is in danger or not. And, and I read everything that I could get my hands on. This was more than a decade ago. And I found that what you found out there was uh, books really in two uh, schools of thought. One school of thought was uh, we're not in a good place and the future is pretty grim. Either we can't solve these problems or the only way to solve these problems is to actually shrink our economies, shrink our aspirations, all live smaller lives. And the other school of thought was either there's no problem at all, just deny it all, or technology is going to solve it automatically for us and we have to do nothing. And to my eye, as I read everything that I could, it was clear that neither of those was true. That the problems are really, really large, and yet our ability to innovate, uh, both in technology and in policy and how we build our cities, all of that, is also incredible if we put our minds to it. And I gravitated uh, in this book and since then really to the topic of energy, because energy, the the late great economist Julian Simon called it the master resource. What he meant by that was, if you have enough energy, you can solve an awful lot of other problems. You can solve a lot of poverty. You can address issues with water by desalinating. You can grow more food on the same land. Uh, people, farmers in America grow four times as much food per acre as farmers in Bangladesh. And it's not because our soil is any better. It's because we have tractors and we have fertilizers and things like that uh, that all take energy. So, so many, not all, but so many of the world's challenges uh, can be met if we have abundant, cheap energy. And yet, despite that, we're in the 21st century, and around the world there's 1.2 billion people that don't have electricity at all. And probably another billion people that can't have some electricity, but can't count on the lights being on when they, when they flip them on. And then the flip side of that is the way that we produce energy today has these massive problems. And the one we probably don't talk about enough is air pollution. Is this a, from the World Health Organization, they actually updated this number to six and a half million people per year die from the effects of air pollution. Some of it's from burning wood, but most of it's coal and diesel, really. Now, anybody have a guess of uh, what's the worldwide death toll from all murder and warfare per year? Anybody want to guess? Toss out a number. It's all good. A million. It's about half a million. So this is more than 10 times as many people are killed by air pollution each year as are killed by warfare and human-on-human and -human violence. We don't talk about that. And then there's this other challenge that we're all wrestling with, which is the planet has a fever. Scientists say uh, the sort of line in the sand that's been drawn is two degrees Celsius, maybe even one and a half degrees Celsius, and we've warmed more or less one degree Celsius, two degrees Fahrenheit, since the pre-industrial era. And of course, climate's a noisy system. 
Uh, it's not a very smooth graph. You see temperature each year sort of bounces around. But as you zoom out, it's obvious that it's going up and up and up. And the four warmest years uh, in modern history, for the last 120 years or so since we started measuring, are all in the last four years. And nine of the ten warmest years in that time are in the last decade. And it's probably, you have to go back about 10,000 years to find a brief period at the end of the last ice age that it was warmer. But you have to go back several million years to find a time that there was more CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's a, a pretty grim situation. And climate change exacerbates all of those other problems. It makes water shortages uh, harder. It melts glaciers that billions of people depend upon their meltwater uh, for fresh water and for agriculture. It uh, puts pressure on forests. It's killing coral reefs as it warms and warms and warms. So how the heck can I be an optimist? I'm an optimist because we are disrupting the way that we generate energy. And that disruption is really, it's economic. This is the price. This is from an organization called IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. This is in the last 10 years, what's happened to the price of wind and solar and offshore wind and concentrating solar. And what you see is they're just plunging in price. And that shaded region of gray or of a sort of a greenish, that's the fossil fuel electricity cost band. And so it used to be a decade ago, 20 years ago for sure, there was no place on Earth where electricity from solar or wind was competitive without subsidies or government support with electricity from coal or natural gas. And that has changed. Really, almost before 2015, it wasn't true. And then in an eye blink, we've gone from solar and wind, sort of the first phase of the development, being entirely policy dependent from 1980 to 2015, to now they're competitive. And it's going to get uh, even more radical than that. And that's causing disruption. So I, I spend time in Silicon Valley. So when you say the word disruption a lot, I don't know if any of you watch any of the satirical shows on, on Silicon Valley, but somebody say, might say disruption is like uh, an Airbnb for cats. Right? I think that company probably really exists. That's nice, but that's not what I'm talking about when I say disruption. This is what I mean by disruption. This is Peabody Coal. Peabody Coal was the largest uh, private sector coal mining company on planet Earth in 2011. 2017, they were bankrupt. 2015, actually, they were bankrupt. And it wasn't just Peabody. We had eight large multi-billion dollar coal mining companies go bankrupt. And we had the global sort of uh, market value of all the world's publicly listed coal companies drop by 90%. Now, it bounced back a bit. It's only 75% down now. But that was an ugly time uh, to be in the coal business. And what happened is this. Uh, the world still uses a lot of coal. Coal is our number one source of energy on planet Earth still, for a little while to come. Not that much longer. But uh, something changed. Between 1850 and the start of the Industrial Revolution uh, until uh, not too long ago, coal consumption just went up and up and up every year. And then in 2013, it peaked. And it hasn't hit that level again ever since. It's sort of bouncing around on a plateau. It went up a little bit in 2017 and 2018, but still short of that peak in 2013. And when you're selling a commodity, into uh, a market that's shrinking instead of growing, you're in a different sort of business. And so that, that economic disruption has come to coal, and as I'll talk about it later, it's going to come to oil as well, and it's going to come to natural gas. And fundamentally, when clean energy is the cheapest energy, it's what will get deployed. Now, this really started because the world got more efficient. Uh, places like China shifted to more of a services economy instead of uh, as much focus on, on manufacturing. And then number two was uh, natural gas in the U.S. But natural gas in the U.S. is no longer the second largest disruptor of coal. It's actually clean energy. It's actually solar and wind. And globally, it's overwhelmingly uh, solar and wind that are the downward pressure on the consumption of coal. And I'll just show you what's happened with these technologies. And again, it's going to be economic, because it's, it's all about, for the people that are building these power plants and utilities running them, it's all about dollars and cents. So to beat 
uh, the construction of a new uh, coal or gas plant. If you're going to build a new coal or gas electricity plant in most parts of the world, it's going to cost you about six cents a kilowatt hour. It's a little bit cheaper in the U.S. We have really cheap natural gas. It might be five cents here. Uh, in Europe, it's more like 10 cents, but we'll use this, this round number. Well, in 1980, electricity from a new wind power plant, a new wind farm in the U.S., cost 10 times that, cost almost 60 cents a kilowatt hour. And now, the average for a new wind farm in the U.S., without any of the subsidies, is about 4 cents. That's a 15 times price reduction in that time. And in fact, we still have some federal tax breaks. They're on a five-year plan to phase out by 2022. So we're actually signing wind power contracts in the Great Plains at about 2 cents a kilowatt hour. And in fact, if we look uh, around the world, of course, it depends on how much wind you have. These red areas uh, are the windiest places on Earth. In those red areas where there's strong winds, we have these incredibly cheap deals, not just in the U.S., but globally. In Morocco, 2.8 cents, half the price of new electricity from coal or gas. In Brazil, 2 cents. 20-year uh, contracts being signed. In Mexico, two cents. In country after country, uh, the price of wind power is coming down and down and down. And breaking through that dashed red line is the, the line of the, roughly the cost of a new coal or gas plant. And here in the U.S., in the Midwest, we have this, this channel of high wind speeds right through the middle of the country. And the, the very strongest winds are in the Great Plains. Uh, and that this color coding, by the way, is the cost of building a wind farm today. And basically, anything yellow to red is cheaper than building a new natural gas plant. Right? And here's what we think it'll be in, in 2025, that zone expanding. And if we zoom in a bit on this region, you see Wisconsin here. Basically, uh, anywhere in Wisconsin, you can build something from, for four cents, three cents, unsubsidized for new wind power. And that's the transition. Again, before 2015, we never saw anything like that. But this is the transition that's going to power this. So I mean, today, I'll just be really clear, wind power is only 6% of electricity around the world. Right? So if you look at it in that axis, we've made very, very little progress. But if you look at it in the axis of, have we gotten it to the point that wind power can compete on its own, whether you have subsidies or not, we're essentially there right now. The second thing that's happened is because if you start talking to people about building wind and solar, they'll say, oh, but wind and solar are really intermittent. And so you need a lot of added cost to the system to handle when they go up and down. And that's, that's somewhat true. But we're building these larger and larger and larger wind turbines. And these turbines have a couple advantages. One is up high, the wind blows uh, faster and more steadily. Number two is if you double the length of a wind turbine blade, you might remember from geometry, the area sweeps through quadruples. It's the square of the length of the radius. And so if you build a, a wind turbine that's twice as big, you get four times the power. So that's a fundamentally a good economics of scale. And you, we have new blades that can be shaped or even dynamically adjust themselves to keep turning in slower and slower winds. So we think about how steady the output from a power generation is in terms of something we call capacity factor. A uh, energy resource that's 100% capacity factor means it's just always on, steady power. We used to build wind farms with a 15% capacity factor, and now we're building them with a 50, sometimes 60% capacity factor. And that's higher than the capacity factor of the coal fleet in uh, India or China. So driven by that first policy around the world and then these economics, wind power around the world has scaled by a factor of five in the last decade. Still only about 6%, about 6%, but growing rapidly. And then now people are turning uh, to build wind turbines offshore. And originally this was driven by uh, sort of crowding in Europe. People didn't want the wind turbines too near them. Uh, but offshore makes some sense because the fastest winds actually aren't on land. They're actually uh, off the coast. In fact, the further and further you get out, uh, the faster and faster the winds are. But people thought, hey, these things 
these, they've got to be anchored to the seabed. Uh, they're at salt water. The maintenance is expensive. You've got to send boat crews out there if you want to fix them. Super expensive. It will never be cost effective. But in 2017, in Europe, we had three different power auctions in Germany where developers bid offshore wind farms at zero subsidy. They would just build them at wholesale prices. That's what happened to the price of offshore wind in Europe over about an eight-year period. And it continues to drop. And these things are now 60, 65 percent capacity factor, so more and more steady. So wind is going to keep getting better, and that's relevant to this region as well. But solar power makes wind power look slow and stagnant. Because what's happened in solar uh, just almost defies belief. Uh, I'm a child of the 70s, and uh, if you look at the cost of solar panels per watt of power that they produce, uh, here's what's happened. In 1977, it cost $77 a watt. Today, the average price on the market is $0.22 cents a watt. That's a 3 hundred and fifty times price decline. And this is, again, this is that master resource. This is the fundamental thing we need to run our factories, our businesses, our, our data centers, eventually to fuel our cars. But you don't see this happening in the price of building roads or building bridges. This is almost like what's happened in, in digital technology happening in a physical technology. And so now we're hitting crossover where in the sunny parts of the world, without subsidies, Solar is just the cheapest energy you can buy and dropping in price the fastest. So again, you got to beat that six cent number. Uh, India, yeah, so China was the, the first country, the big coal user to sort of taper off. And coal companies thought, well, India will keep going in, in coal demand because India's got as many people as China, roughly, and they have even less energy. So they're going to keep going more and more coal, but that's not happening. 93% of the new electrical generation built in India this fiscal year, since July 1st, has been solar. Because suddenly, you have solar bids that are a quarter cheaper than building uh, new coal plants in India. The price of solar contracts in India dropped by a factor of four in four years. In the US, this is a slightly out of date, we had uh, this bid a few months ago, Tucson, 3.3 cents, that's an unsubsidized number. With the federal subsidies, it actually was about 2.3 cents. Uh, but that was just beaten in Idaho. I don't think of Idaho as all that sunny, but it's pretty sunny in some parts. In Idaho, they had a bid at 2.1 cents. That turns out to be about 3.1 if you take away all the subsidies. About half the price of power from coal. And these, this is a long-term, these are 20-year contracts. The price of 20-year solar contracts in the U.S. has dropped by a factor of 10 in the last 10 years. Like if you had told anyone this 10 years ago, they would have asked what you were smoking. I mean, they really would not have believed that anything like this was going to occur, but that is what's occurred. And in fact, if you look closely, that this purple is the Midwest. You can find a few uh, Midwestern bids uh, around 2016, 2017, coming in at five cents a kilowatt hour. All right, and so that's what's happening. And around the world, it's cheaper than that. This is one of my favorite photos of, of all time, actually. This is actually at Dubai, not Abu Dhabi. That's the, the, the prince of Dubai. And in one of the oil capitals of the world, uh, solar being built at 2.4 cents. Uh, in Chile, the Atacama Desert, super sunny place, 2.1 cents. In Mexico, 2 cents. In Saudi Arabia, they just signed a deal at 1.99 cents. And now the world's cheapest. There's some cheaper ones, but they have some funny subsidies in them. Uh, so around the world, the price of solar just crashing through that uh, fossil fuel electricity cost comparing new solar to new coal or gas. And so driven by that, solar hasn't grown by a factor of five, it's grown by a factor of 30 in the last decade. Now it's still, it's extremely small, it's just over 2% of world electricity. Uh, but this is a, an exponential growth rate. In fact, if you take a hockey stick and you put it on an exponential scale, so it goes, the vertical goes one, 10, 100, 1,000, it's a straight line, it's truly exponential, and here's what solar looks like on one of those. One, 10, 100, 1,000. In the last decade, last two decades, the amount of solar around the world has grown by a factor of 1,000. Now, it grew from basically nothing to still very small, but this is an uninterrupted explosion. Basically, it's been doubling every two or three years. Maybe it's slowed down a bit the last uh, five years, but I'll make the case it's actually going to speed up 
again. And so what that means is this. First, I told you there's 1.2 billion people without electricity or on planet Earth. Where do they live? Sunny places, yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, India, Southeast Asia, a few in Latin America. So some of the poorest people on Earth are eventually going to have some of the cheapest electricity on Earth. That's a lucky accident, but we'll take it. And two, it means that now, and again, remember, before 2015, this just wasn't true anywhere on planet Earth, just about. Now, in all of these areas, you can build new solar cheaper than you can build new coal or gas power plants. And that changes everything. And it's going to keep getting cheaper. In fact, we can, we can measure the pace of solar price reduction pretty well. And it's actually best to quantify it in terms of volume. Every doubling of the amount of solar we deploy around the world brings down the price around 30%. That's what we've seen historically. Some people might say 25, 28, 30 is what the, probably the most authoritative uh, number is. And so what that means is solar has been going through a cycle like this. At first, it was incredibly expensive. It was so expensive, it only made sense to put it on satellites to power them in space, because you'd pay basically anything to have some amount of uh, power there. But then it gained some first markets due to big subsidies, but then it it grew in volume, and then as it grew in volume, these companies could reinvest dollars into R&D and, and making their manufacturing more efficient, making better panels, and it dropped in price. And now it's going through the cycle again and again and again. And what I will tell you is it's now, I don't want to say quite unstoppable, but in a neutral policy environment, on a, on a fair playing field, solar will now expand and become cheap enough to be the cheapest source of new electricity in all of those areas. Almost everything except uh, the very northernmost reaches of, of Europe and maybe Siberia. Now, does anybody know where solar really got started? What country on Earth uh, really started deploying solar aggressively and subsidizing it really heavily first? Germany, very good. Who is that? Raise your hand. How do you know that? It is a dreary climate. Because this is the sunlight of Europe, and Germany is like right here, and Germany is not a very sunny place. right? And so the Europeans actually uh, spent a couple hundred billion euros subsidizing solar and wind. Germany, Spain, Italy especially, uh, starting in the, the 2000s, when solar cost 20 times what it does today in a place that has uh, you know, less sun than most parts of Canada. And at the end of that period, when you got to about 2015, you could say, what did they get for it? Solar was 1% of world electricity then, and wind was 4% of world electricity. And you could say that money was... It was so expensive, it bought you basically nothing. It made no difference. Except that it drove down the price to the point that the rest of the world could start deploying it profitably. And so what you saw is eventually, in all these European countries, they just couldn't bear the subsidies anymore. Taxpayers revolted. And so across Europe, by the early you know, 2012, let's say, solar uh, stopped growing. But now it's growing again, because now it's come full circle. And now you have, in parts of Europe, solar that for the first time is cheaper than building new coal and new gas. In Spain, we have some bids down three euro cents, less than four cents a kilowatt hour. And even in Germany, we have solar being built at you know, 4.3 euro cents, about five US cents a kilowatt hour. And natural gas is super expensive there, and coal is expensive there. So that's the cheapest new electricity you can build in Germany. Now, that's crazy. I didn't expect that. And just let me just put this in context, what that means for Wisconsin. Because here's how much sunlight different parts of the U.S. gets. And let's draw in Wisconsin. I hope I got that right. And just for context, I didn't free draw that. I downloaded that image. That's nice. And just for context, uh, here to scale is Germany. So the least sunny part of Wisconsin is sunnier than the sunniest part of Germany. And Germany, it has people bidding 
five cents or maybe sometimes six cents a kilowatt hour for a new solar. So that's what the natural price of solar would be in Wisconsin if Wisconsin had competitive auctions for solar or for energy at all, which it doesn't today. So that's, that's one lesson, and we'll come back to that. And if solar keeps getting this cheap, or keeps dropping in price at this pace, what we're going to see is solar getting down to one cent a kilowatt hour in places like California, and maybe one and a half cents a kilowatt hour here in Wisconsin. Not right away, but maybe in, over the next 20 years. And that is just basically unbeatable by almost anything. So solar is going to uh, keep getting uh, cheaper. Now, again, one of the prime objections to clean energy is that it's intermittent, right? The sun goes down, and sometimes the wind stops blowing. So what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you put them together. Because solar and wind are actually mostly countercyclical. That means is the sun only shines during the day, or if the sun's shining at night, something very strange has happened. But the sun only shines during the day, and statistically, the wind blows more at night. And then the sun, this is averaged across all of the U.S. over 36 years. Uh, the yellow area is the sunlight falling across the U.S., and the purple area is the wind power across all the U.S. So in summer, you've got a lot of solar, and in, wind, uh, in winter, you've got a lot more wind. And so if you put these together over a continent scale, you end up being able to get maybe 70%, maybe 80% of your electricity from solar and wind without even talking about energy storage yet. Now, I did say over a continent scale, and that's another challenge, because this is not the U.S. grid. This is the U.S. grid. This is the dream of what the U.S. grid could look like. Uh, and if we had our druthers and did the cheapest thing, most economical thing, the fastest way to decarbonize, what we'd have is a grid where in winter we'd have a lot of wind power being exported from the Midwest, and in summer we'd have a lot of solar coming in from the south and the southwest and counterbalancing each other. And of course in summer there's still some wind, and in winter there's still some solar. And that's the, the best way to go about doing it. Now, there's a political challenge to building this, which is it's just hard to get approval to build uh, high voltage lines, build any trans sort of transmission lines. There's various ideas out there, like using the uh, interstate freeway system or using uh, railroad rights of ways to get this done. It's not going to happen in the current political environment. But one of the things I'll ask all of you is, you all know NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. Well, you know what the logical extension of NIMBY is? It's banana. Build absolutely nothing near anyone again, <laughs> right? Like, I think I got that wrong. It was close enough. You got the idea. It's definitely a very banana-like. So you should be the opposite. I'm a Yimby. Yes, in my backyard. Because if we're going to solve this problem, we're going to have to realize you're going to have to put the solar or the wind or the transmission line somewhere. So that's my number one ask of you, is be a Yimby. Now, I told you this is technologically and economically doable if we have the rights of way. And I'll just illustrate that by uh, this. This is China. And in China, the electricity load is mostly on the east. Peking is Beijing, Shanghai, down to Guangzhou, which is where your iPhone was made. Uh, and there's, they're not really very sunny or windy. But in China, there's a lot of sun and a lot of wind uh, deep in the interior, in the Gobi Desert and up uh, near Mongolia and so on. So China has built the world's largest ultra-high voltage DC grid that basically exists to take sun and wind from those uh, sunny and windy areas to the demand centers uh, in the east. And the longest of those lines just opened, 3,400 miles, that's 2,100 miles long. It adds one and a half cents to the cost of electricity, and it's 90% efficient. Like, that's the technology we have today. And if we did that in the U.S., we'd be talking about taking solar from New Mexico to New York. That's what we could accomplish if we could overcome uh, the rights of way and NIMBY issues here. All right, all that said, maybe that gets you to 70, 80% of electricity, but now the most exciting thing happening in clean energy is this. It's energy storage. You all know who this guy is, right? Yeah, that's, that's Tony Stark. <laughs> <laughs> Closest thing we've got. Elon, well, he, sometimes I think he knows he's Tony Stark or pretends. Uh, the reason I show this is that the reason that Tesla makes these great batteries isn't because uh, Elon went into the lab and created the arc 
reactor with the help of, of his assistants, it's because lithium ion batteries behave just like solar. Since just 2010, the price of lithium ion batteries has dropped by 85%. Like 2010 feels like yesterday. That this is a, a eight times price decline. In fact, I know companies that are deploying it at, at cheaper than that. Right? That's what's made this possible. And now batteries are still expensive. They're still way more expensive than grid power, but they're cheap enough that they're starting to win bids. We had a, a solicitation in uh, Arizona where a utility owned by Warren Buffett put out a bid for we want power between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. because there's a lot of solar there, but solar is starting to, to go down. You know, the sun's at a lower angle by 4 p.m. and people still want electricity. They have heavy air conditioning load, malls are open, the, you know, lights are on in your home, the appliances are running, so that peak of electricity demand goes out to 8 p.m. or so. And historically, only one technology would win that bid, and that's natural gas, because it's more flexible than coal, can go up and down rapidly, but not this time. First solar won that bid, a solar company with batteries that they installed in one of their plants. And in fact, in the news uh, just yesterday, or last week maybe, a company called Sunrun, that deploys solar on people's homes, uh, and now is deploying batteries in people's homes, won a bid like this in California as well. And batteries, like solar, are going to keep dropping in price, another three to five times. And that's just one battery technology, lithium ion. Beyond that, we have solid state batteries that are smaller and light, uh, still in the lab, or uh, this is a flow battery. It's just for grid power. It's big and heavy. You'd never put it in your phone or your car, but it can work instead of a, you know, your battery in your phone starts to wear out after three years. These can work for 30 years. Uh, and thus end up being cheaper overall. So energy storage is going to keep getting cheaper too. Now the thing is though, that the forecasters that, that tell us what's going to happen in energy just keep missing it. And they keep missing what's happening. They keep sort of sandbagging uh, what will actually occur because of this. This is something we talk about at Singularity, which is that that we're used to thinking about things linearly. We, we expect technology to improve very, very slowly. And new technologies, I think about a digital camera. When digital cameras uh, first came on the market, uh, when they were first invented, we have film cameras. And film cameras were tremendously better. They had a lot higher resolution, and you could you know, make a nice, glossy print. And digital cameras were just terrible. Right? They had a few hundred pixels, and they were expensive and bulky, and the battery life was terrible. And so you would have been forgiven for thinking, and a lot of people did think, they will never be as good as film cameras. They were on that green line at the bottom, the edge of disappointment, the, the zone of disappointment. This, this thing is a toy. Why would I ever want this? But they just kept getting better, and they improved at a much faster rate than film cameras did. And then one day, people woke up, and they were just better. And we were all like, how'd that happen? And now they're tremendously better, right? You can post to Facebook straight from your phone and, and so on. And so this is happening and it's confusing the forecasters. So the official forecaster of the world in energy is the IEA, the International Energy Agency. And the IEA is not what I would call uh, a uh, uh, very progressive organization, right? Let me, I'm going to show you what the IEA predicts for the growth of solar around the world every year versus what's actually happened. Every year, the IEA puts out a report called the WEO, the World Energy Outlook. And in that report, they forecast how much solar will the world install every year henceforth. And so the black line going up is how much solar the world has actually installed every year. And the colored lines are each year's forecast from the IEA of what would actually happen uh, with solar installations every year. Now, do you see a problem here? It's like some uh, analyst with Excel is like going to last year's formula and hitting copy paste, right? And that, that's not a methodology. And fundamentally, they're missing because they don't understand the cost decline. This is the US EIA, the equivalent of it. And those colored lines are their forecast of successive years of what would happen with solar cost. And they basically say every year, oh, solar is not going to get any cheaper than it is now. And every year it does. Right? Or I mentioned offshore wind. Here's the IEA. Here's a forecast they made in 2017 of how cheap offshore wind would get. And then here's what actually happened. By you know, bids the next year were cheaper than what the IEA thought would happen in 2040. 
All right. Or here's batteries, probably the best of these. Here's the U.S. EIA, the part of the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, here's their forecast for what happened with lithium-ion battery prices. So it's going to be amazing. They're going to drop in cost by a third by 2048. Uh, and then the blue and, and red lines are some big optimists. Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, Navigant, these are think tanks or publishers that are very optimistic about clean energy. And they said, well, batteries are going to drop a lot faster than that. Here's what actually happened. It happened even twice as fast as the optimists thought. So trust the innovators and not the forecasters. The forecasters have status quo bias. They expect the future to look like the past, and it doesn't. Not in this area of clean energy. I prefer this. This is a hindcast. This is from Alliance Bernstein. Alliance Bernstein are not environmentalists. They're a private equity group in New York. They're about money, and that's really all they're about, is investing in, in a way that makes sense. And they created this chart about three years ago. It's called Welcome to the Terror Dome. And they're telling their clients to be very, very afraid. And across the bottom is the cost of uh, liquefied natural gas, oil, and coal. Gas, oil, and coal across the bottom. So the 70 year chart. And at the upper right, that gray line, what's that? I think that's somebody's child took a crayon and scrawled in their parents' report. That's the price of solar coming down. And that's the price of wind and the price of batteries coming down with it. And so now I told you we've had two different phases of clean energy, right? Phase one was, it was entirely subsidy dependent. It was entirely policy dependent. Clean energy only got deployed because Europe especially just subsidized the heck out of it. And then phase two was around 2015, it got competitive. And in some parts of the world, it was cheaper to build new solar or wind than to build uh, new coal or gas. Those are the first two phases. But now we're about to enter something else, a third phase, where it's cheaper to build solar or wind than to keep existing coal or gas plants running. And I'm a science fiction writer. That probably sounds like science fiction, right? But it's not me saying it. I was actually skeptical this would ever happen. So here's somebody saying it. This is Jim Robo, the CEO, CEO of Nextair, one of the biggest utilities in the U.S. He said it uh, February 2018. He said by the early 2020s, it would be cheaper to build new solar and wind than to keep their existing coal plants running. And then a think tank called Carbon Tracker did the numbers. They said here's the operating cost of coal in the U.S. and here's the cost of new solar in it agrees. But it didn't take till the early 2020s. Because in October of last year, a utility in northern Indiana called NIPSCO put out their five-year planning document, and they said this. They said the cheapest thing for them was they could save customers $4 billion by going from being 65% coal-powered, which they are right now, to 15% in 2023, four years from now. And that they would replace it, not with natural gas, they've got some gas. All of their replacement would be solar, wind, batteries, and some flexible demand. That's crazy. That's really, really, really crazy. And the thing about NIPSCO is, and northern Indiana, is it's not that different than Wisconsin in some ways. Because they're 65% coal-powered, Wisconsin is 50% coal-powered. 25% of your electricity, nuclear, hydro, solar, and wind is carbon-free. The rest is carbon, right? It's not that different from northern Indiana. And it's not that different in geography either, because here's Wisconsin, and I it didn't have time to put it in the Indiana map, but it's more or less the same amount of sunlight that happens. And if we zoom in on wind, it's, it's more or less the same wind conditions in Wisconsin as it is in northern Indiana. So if NIPSCO can do it, if northern Indiana can do it, then Wisconsin can too. But there are policy changes that are needed. In Indiana, they have competitive auctions. The low bidder for energy wins. They have a five-year planning process that you don't have here. They have a variety of other small but important policy changes uh, that I know that some folks in the audience care very deeply about. But from a global standpoint, to address climate change, it doesn't really matter what NIPSCO does. What matters is this is that map of coal generation. That's China. The yellow area is China. So what matters is what happens in China from a global perspective. But China, you may or may not know, China is the number one country in the world for deploying solar, the number one country in the world for deploying uh, wind, number one for making solar, number one for making wind, number one for making batteries. They're number two for deploying batteries after the US. So we're, we're still number one in, in one of those areas. And we're number two in most of the rest. But China, carbon tracker did the same math, and it looks like this. The cost of coal is going up there. And by the 2020s, 
it'll be cheaper to build new solar or new wind than to keep existing coal power plants running in China. That's amazing. Now, this all comes from Carbon Tracker, and they're a think tank, and they care about climate change. Maybe they're biased. So I got one more source. And this source, this is just two or three uh, weeks old. This is McKinsey Consultants. And they did similar math. And they, this chart is what year will it be cheaper to build solar or wind than to keep existing gas or coal plants running in different parts of the world? And in the US, you know, mostly it happens by 2030. But again, in China and in India, it all happens in the 2020s and before 2030. So that is the most optimistic thing I can tell you about electricity. But that's only electricity. So one more, there's one other really big source of energy, and that's we use a lot of oil. And in fact, in the US, because of natural gas and uh, wind and solar, uh, emissions, carbon emissions from electricity have been dropping, but carbon emissions from transportation have held steady and are now number one. We actually have more carbon going into the atmosphere in the U.S. Uh, from oil than from coal and gas now. And this we have to address. But we, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this quote in a second. If we were talking about oil 10 years ago, we were talking about peak oil. Anybody remember those conversations? That the world couldn't produce enough oil. Oil was going to get very expensive. We don't talk about that anymore. There's enough oil to fry us all, to be honest. And, and it makes some sense. When the price of oil goes up, the, the economics of exploring for oil or innovating on how you drill for oil get better and better. So there's more motivation uh, to go after that oil when the price of oil goes up. I'm talking about peak oil demand. Like what happened to coal that coal peaked in 2013? I'm talking about the world needing less oil than it does today. And I'm not the first person to say that. I'm not the hundredth person to say that. The first person I know of to say it was a Saudi, Sheikh Ahmed Yamani. He was the Saudi oil minister during the OPEC uh, oil crisis of the 70s. And in 2000, he had this to say. He said, guys, the Stone Age didn't end for a lack of stone. Right? It ended because of bronze. We had a better technology. Bronze was lighter. You could make it sharp. You could make it in new shapes. You could fix it if it was damaged. And so all those rocks became... No. I think we always had an overabundance of rocks, but they became even less important. And so he's warning his fellow sheikhs, this is going to happen to oil, and we better adapt. And he was ahead of his time, but he was right. And it's not just one technology, it's three technologies together. It starts with electrification. And electrification, now everybody sees electric cars are cool, but 11, 12 years ago, this was an electric car before Tesla, right? Like, you could be forgiven for not thinking this was ever going to replace an awful lot of, of automobiles. Certainly if you had pride in your vehicle, this is not what you wanted to get caught dead in. But then, then Tesla arrived on the scene. And Elon, I think Elon actually has a number of flaws. But Elon has done some amazing stuff. It, most disruption comes in from the low end. A product that's cheaper and is worse, but it is good enough. But... Elon Musk came in from the high end. He made a $250,000 uh, electric sports car that was the fastest car you could buy, and that turned into an $80,000 electric luxury car, first car to get 101 on car and driver, and that turned into a $35,000, like, you know, a nice car. The average price of a new car in the U.S., by the way, is $33,500, is what the average uh, price people pay across all categories. And now Tesla, the Tesla Model S is the best-selling large luxury vehicle, and the Tesla Model 3 is the best-selling uh, small luxury vehicle in the world, right, and in the U.S. And it's not just Tesla. Six months ago, I would have told you, I don't know if Tesla's going to make it. They might go back up. They still might. And I would, I would hate for that to happen, but it won't stop this revolution because now it's unleashed everybody. VW, uh, re recoiling from Dieselgate, is spending $50 billion on electric vehicles over the next few years. The world's auto manufacturers in some have about $255 billion that they're spending on electric vehicles. General Motors says its future is all electric, right? And this is crazy talk because electric vehicles, there's about a billion cars in the world, and only five million are electric today. That's one half of 1%. That's a rounding error. Like we had a graph of how much energy is used in transport, it'd be like a pixel. Right? It wouldn't matter. But the growth rate is off the hook. 
It took 18 years to sell the first million electric vehicles. It took 18 months to sell the second million. It took about uh, 10 months to sell the third million, six months for the fourth million, and four months for the fifth million. That's what exponential growth looks like. In the US, electric vehicle sales grew 81% last year, nearly doubled. With one million electric vehicles in the US right now, we're forecasting 12 million by five years from now, six years from now, all right? That's what's happening. And in fact, it's just like solar, if you look at the forecasters, here's what's happened over just three years of forecast changes from a variety of different organizations. OPEC lifted their forecast by a factor of 10. I thought that was neat. Uh, they, they still think there's going to be more oil. Bloomberg New Energy Finance is the most aggressive. But even these are probably conservative, as I'll show you. But then something even crazier happened. I talked about peak coal, right, and peak oil demand. We might have just hit peak gasoline car. And six months ago, I would have told you peak gasoline car at the rate that electric vehicles are growing might be uh, 2023, if they kept growing. But it might have been 2017, right? Here's car sales around the world. And the ones in pink are gasoline, 77.7 million in 2017, and it was down in 2018. And it looks, the forecast is going to be down in 2019. Some of that's just cyclic, car sales have slowed down in China and so on. But meanwhile, electric vehicles are growing 60%, 70% a year. So all the growth in vehicle sales is electric. All right. All right, that's technology one. Number two is transport as a service. And I'll, I know Uber and Lyft are not super big in this area yet, but they'll, they'll probably get here. I'll tell you at home, I take a Lyft a lot. And the interesting thing about this is, uh, Uber and Lyft in cities around the world didn't disrupt taxis. They grew a whole new market. Taxis in the US peaked at 1.4 billion rides a year. Uber and Lyft did three times that last year. So it turns out that if you can always know where the vehicle is, you can retrieve your items, and you've got ratings and reviews and so on, and you don't need to deal with cash, people like it. And if it's about half the cost, because most of the world uh, it's about half the cost per mile to take an Uber or Lyft as it is a taxi. So people will use it for things that they just wouldn't have used a taxi for. So what does that have to do with electric? It's this. You're going to take the cheaper option, right? Electric is about to become, or already is, the cheapest option. If you look at the cost of an electric vehicle, not just the upfront cost, but the total cost per mile, and add in the electricity and the maintenance cost versus the gasoline, it's already cheaper. Here's the cost of a, a gasoline vehicle. The vehicle's cheap, but the fuel's expensive. Here's the cost over a four-year period, or one year if it's a taxi. The vehicle's more expensive up front, but the electricity is far cheaper because it's about 90% efficient. Your gasoline car is about 15% efficient. Your electric car is super efficient, right? And so if that's the case, then people who are really thinking about the cost per mile are going to switch to electric rapidly. And then we're going to have this cycle happen. The more electric cars we sell, uh, the cheaper they'll get. The cheaper they get, the more people will buy them. Uh, and then that means that they drop in price some more. And the ultimate thing I'll tell you is going to be really crazy is electric cars up front are about to be cheaper than gasoline cars. Now we think it's about 2021. And then far cheaper. And here's why. This is the engine and drivetrain of an electric vehicle. This is the engine and drivetrain of a gasoline vehicle. It's got about 20 times as many moving parts. So the only reason this is more expensive than this is batteries are expensive, and that's changing. And this is made in low volume, and this is made in high volume. And don't take my word for it. Here's Ford. Ford said in 2017, when they look at the manufacturing cost for electric vehicles versus gasoline, it takes half as much, half the factory floor space to make an electric car. It takes half the factory capital cost, the upfront cost of the factory, to make the same number of vehicles if it's electric. And the labor cost drops by third. Actually, the labor cost on the drivetrain is about one-fifth as much, but you still have to make windshields and, and seats and stuff like that, so it still costs money. So that means electric vehicles are going to be cheaper up front. And we just saw the maintenance costs are lower. This is about two weeks ago. New York City put out this chart of their maintenance costs per year of different types of car. The gray cars are gasoline vehicles, and the green ones are electric vehicles. 
There's no belts. You don't have to change the oil. The only maintenance is you take it in, they rotate the tires. That's really it with an electric vehicle. And every decade you have to change the battery. So that means we're talking about a moment where electric vehicles on a per mile basis aren't 20% cheaper, but where they're half the cost, maybe by 2030. And that means, uh, A, people driving Ubers and Lyfts or taxis are going to switch to them more rapidly, and that'll encourage more of us uh, to take these vehicles. Maybe not uh, in Stephen's point as much, but I'll tell you that in Seattle, where I live, if it's so cheap, it's cheaper than parking downtown for me to get into a Lyft. Lyft also offsets all the carbon from my ride, which is very nice. And then the third technology, which is really science fiction, and we don't need it, but if it happens, it makes things happen even faster, is autonomy, is self-driving cars. And self-driving cars are coming on faster uh, than most believe, I think. In December, uh, Waymo, Waymo is really Google. Google started, uh, they uh, commercialized their trial of self-driving in the suburbs of Phoenix. Phoenix is nice because there's no snow. It'll take a little bit longer to get to Wisconsin. No snow, the streets are wide, uh, it's sunny all the time. It's a nice, easy environment for them. Uh, but there's a, it's a closed beta, it's like Gmail was in the first days. But a few hundred families have this app called Waymo One, and they can call, uh, like an Uber, a self-driving uh, robot taxi that comes and picks them up. And then General Motors paid a billion dollars for this startup cruise. When I'm in San Francisco, these cars go by me all the time. Uh, and then another investor, actually Honda, came and gave another $2 billion uh, to have a little piece of this startup. And Cruise just got approval from the, the Highway Safety Board to have a vehicle with no pedals and no steering wheel on the streets in all 50 states by the end of this year. And GM says they'll have an operating robot taxi service by the end of this year. Now, software companies yeah, and, and so on, we, we, we sell vapor sometimes, so I don't know if it'll really be this year. And, and Waymo had made it sound like they'd have it. Anybody in Phoenix could use it, and it's not there yet. Maybe it'll take a little bit longer. But I think it'll happen within the next few years. And that's because I can quantify it. When these guys test in California... Uh, they have a metric, which is they have to report to the state every year how many miles did I drive, uh, in, uh, my, uh, how many miles did my autonomous vehicle drives, and how many times did a human have to take over. And these human takeovers, are, they're not emergencies, they're not the human latching on. It's usually the vehicle gets confused, and it stops, or it pulls off to the side of the road, uh, and so they, it phones home, or the safety driver has to take it over. Uh, they're, they're easily confused sometimes. Like, there's some good stories, actually. And so, so we have the numbers. In 2015, uh, Waymo drove about 1,500 miles per human intervention. Last year, they drove 11,000 miles per human intervention. And crews and a variety of startups uh, coming up behind them. So another three years, they could be at 50,000 miles per human intervention. And then they'd be something that a lot of people would be willing to take. Maybe they won't not go into crowded grocery store parking lots. They're not going to go off-road. They might not come to rural areas. But in cities and suburbs that are well-mapped, uh, in good weather at any rate, uh, they will come there, and then they'll get better and better and better. And in fact, Tesla had some announcement today. I've been uh, in conversations all day. I haven't seen it. But Tesla's the other wild card. Tesla had just deploys new software over the air. If you own a Tesla, you get an email that says, your car has new features. And so Tesla, this is a 2017 Model S with software they've not released, uh, just driving around. And the guy doesn't have his hands on the wheel again. It's daylight, it's good weather, and so on. But this technology is coming. OK, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it's cool, but half the cost per mile of an Uber or a Lyft is the driver. A taxi is about $3.50 a mile, and Uber or Lyft is about $1.50 a mile. Uh, without a driver, it's 75 cents, but I told you electric would be half the price, so now we're talking about 35 cents a mile to ride into one of these electric robo-taxis instead of 80 cents a mile, which is what it costs to own your vehicle. And why have a four-seater vehicle? The average number of people in a taxi is like 1.1. It could be a two-seater, or it could be, uh, we don't want that much congestion, everybody in a four-seater vehicle. We could have, uh, this is a vehicle I saw in Copenhagen, electric, autonomous, 12-seater uh, minibus. And those prices get down to ridiculous low numbers, 10 to 15 cents a mile. And if that happens, people might adopt this very, very, 
very rapidly. And it's coming to delivery vans and trucks as well. There's about 250 million cars in the US. There's only 15 million semi-tractor trailers. And it looks like the Tesla Semi, if they deliver, is going to be at 20% cheaper per mile than a diesel. How long will it take those trucking companies to switch to electric if it saves them money? Right? They will. And so that means that if you look at how the world uses oil, about two-thirds of the world's oil demand is stuff that we think could be replaced. And now even oil companies, not American oil companies, but European oil companies are starting to see this. Total in France says the peak of oil demand could happen by 2030. Equinor in Norway says it'll happen in the 2020s. Shell says it'll happen uh, sometime between 2021 and 2031. And it could happen even faster than that. Because, again, we're talking about uh, if this autonomy really delivers a quarter of the price to take an uh, autonomous taxi than to own your own car. I think a lot of people keep your own car. You'll hang on to your car, have the car seats in it, skis, in case you're really driving a long distance cross country. But it'll sit there in the driveway of the garage. And you'll take this for sort of your everyday uh, commute. And so how fast will people switch? We don't know. Uh, but here's one example. There was a year that uh, Uber <clears throat> dropped their price in half. And when they did that, their number of miles driven went up by a factor of eight in one year. So this could happen very, very, very rapidly. So what does that mean uh, for when will the world peak in its use of oil? Well, here's the International Energy Agency. It says uh, world oil demand will keep rising more or less forever. But that's the kind of thing they like to say. Here's uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. They say the peak could happen as soon as 2020. I think that's a little ambitious, but I think it's something like this. I think before 2030, in the next 10 years, <clears throat> maybe as soon as five years from now, <clears throat> we will see oil start to be a shrinking industry rather than a growing industry. And capital chases growth. The world has trillions of dollars of money and investment funds and so on that are looking for something to invest in. I know it's a crazy thought, but it's true. Capital chases growth. You're not going to see an awful lot. You don't see a lot of investment in coal mines or coal power plants now. The more that this happens, the more it's going to shift to clean energy. Now, that being said, we're not out of danger yet. Right? I've given you the optimistic story, but we are still in a planetary crisis. Crisis is both a danger and opportunity, the Chinese say, and that the danger is still here because I've just talked about the two easiest things, electricity and ground transport, but there's still a whole bunch of unsolved problems if we look at climate change. Agriculture and deforestation are almost a quarter of the world's uh, carbon emissions. Uh, industry, making cement, steel, buildings, uh, 20%. Uh, building heat. You know, we, we know how to do that in a lot of climates, but not yet in Wisconsin. And airplanes are only 2%, but they're rising fast. Right? So we still have all of these problems to solve, and we still haven't peaked in global carbon emissions. They're still going up. More slowly than they were, but they're still going up. And every year that we delay reaching that peak and starting to come down, the eventual pace that we have to come down is faster if we want to stay below any of these targets. And basically, we've almost run out of time to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Two degrees Celsius might still be possible. If we can decarbonize fully by 2050, uh, we have a, a solid chance at two degrees. But even that's going to be a stretch. All right, so I'm going to end with some thoughts on how you all can take action. Number one. Be an entrepreneur. And for those who are part of the university here, encourage entrepreneurship. And by entrepreneur, I don't mean you have to invent the next great solar technology, uh, but a lot of what happens is people actually building a business out of getting, and getting this out to customers. That's, I invest in this sort of stuff. Two, boost your business by being clean and demand of the businesses that you buy from that they're clean. These are global brands that are in the RE100. These are companies that have committed to, uh, by 2040, I think, going to 100% clean electricity. And you look at the companies uh, headquartered on the coast, you look at the Googles and Facebooks and Microsofts, uh, they're, they're getting there much faster. And they're doing it because 
They want their customers to love them. They're doing it because the leadership of the company believes in it, and they're doing it because their employees want it. 6,500 Amazon employees last week signed a letter demanding that their employer, Amazon, uh, go clean more quickly. So this is an opportunity, whether you're a consumer or a business owner or a community that wants to attract one of these businesses, to think about that. Three, be an effective advocate. We have a global crisis, and yet climate change is a politically divisive uh, phrase and topic in the United States. And so I will say this, and this might be counterintuitive, the best way to advocate for climate solutions in the U.S. is not to mention climate change at all. Because while climate change is politically toxic, uh, at least in a, in a purple area, and the country as a whole we'd say is purple, everybody loves clean energy. This is the number of people that say we should accelerate clean energy in the U.S. is 84%, and among conservative Republicans, it's 68%. Everybody loves solar, everybody loves wind, even natural gas pulls 20% uh, below wind, and you know, coal is sort of in the, in the basement for most of it. Right? So advocate for clean energy, and you will find allies, in some cases, across the aisle. And secondly, in being an effective advocate, it's easy to tell and focus on the horror stories. This is a, a, a study that was done, as many studies like it, of what works best, dire messages or positive messages. Dire messages are, uh, I'm really worried about climate change, sea level's gonna rise, I don't think I should have kids in climate change, and I understand that, that, that this hits us emotionally. Yet if you wanna persuade someone who's on the fence, those messages actually harden hearts. They actually make people who are already skeptical more skeptical. I'm not saying, you know, don't believe it. I'm not saying don't talk about it with your friends. But if you want to persuade someone who's not already persuaded, the message that works is about innovation, is about clean technology, is about solving problems, is about cheaper energy for everybody. All right. Four. Advocate for more clean energy. 29 states in the U.S. have a clean energy portfolio standard. Uh, Wisconsin has one, but you blew past it in, in 2012 or 2013. It's still stuck at 10% at, uh, uh, is the mandate. Uh, California passed 100% uh, as their new one. New Mexico, uh, similar. Uh, Washington State, we have 100% on the governor's desk. He's going to sign it. Uh, and it's not Nevada. Uh, is probably going to sign a 50% one. Illinois, there's a 100% bill under consideration and it has decent chance of being passed there. Uh, and Pennsylvania, a Republican legislator, introduced a 40% uh, clean energy standard last year. It didn't get voted on. So we came back here this year with a 50%. And it, it might just pass because there's a lot of energy around this right now. And finally, keep hope. This stuff can wear on us, and it can get us really down. But I want to tell you that we have had very, very serious environmental challenges in the past, and we've overcome them. Because this was New York City in the 1960s, or LA. It looked like Beijing or Mumbai, right? And here's New York now, right? Or the problem we had on planet Earth that's probably the most similar to climate change in terms of its global scale was the ozone hole and the depletion of the ozone layer. And this is what uh, the ozone layer around the world looked like in 1989. And with no ozone, all life on Earth would end. I mean, it's, it's a, about as existential a risk as, as you can imagine. Uh, UV rays destroy DNA, and it turns out we have DNA, and it's not really good for it to get destroyed. Maybe if we could have lived under the ocean or something, that's really science fiction. And yet, the ozone layer is healing. And it's healing, it'll take decades, but it's healing a little faster than expected. And that happened because we signed a global deal called the Montreal Protocol. Industry said it couldn't be done or it would cost 10 times what it actually ended up costing. And in just a decade, we reduced the release of these chlorofluorocarbons like Freon that destroy ozone. And this, by the way, you know who was president when we signed this? Ronald Reagan was president when he signed this. Who knows why? Maybe his sister uh, uh, suffered from skin cancer. Maybe that affected him. But my favorite story is this. This is the Cuyahoga River. Who knows this story already? Uh, a lot of you know. Oh, you gave away my punchline. Lovely bucolic place. This is what it looked like in 1968. 
You could dip your hand in this river and come out with it covered in oil and sludge and chemicals, right? And because this river was lined with factories and warehouses that were there because the river provided cheap transportation. You could get your goods uh, you know, to and from really easily and also provided cheap waste disposal services, i.e. just dump a, a bucket into the river when you're done with it, right? Free, a free unless you live downstream of that bucket. And then in 69, a train going across a bridge on this, uh, over this river, its metal wheels through a spark, and the spark drifted down, and the Cuyahoga caught on fire. That was 68. And now the Cuyahoga River looks like this. And the GDP of Cleveland has quadrupled in that time. We didn't have to end economic growth to solve this. But the Cuyahoga River fire uh, galvanized the country, and in the next three years, we created the EPA, passed the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, and that was all under Richard Nixon, actually. So with that, I will just leave you uh, some time for questions and tell you that I am an optimist because of our ability and your ability to help us drive innovation and change in America to solve these problems. Thank you very much. And we do have time for folks to come up to these mics and ask questions. The microphones help just because there's going to be some sound as people have to head off for dinner or go to other classes. But if you want to come up to the front, grab a mic and ask Romez a question. Come on up. Someone's got to be first. All right. Uh, so I deal with food and nutrition issues. How do you see this um, clean energy revolution really changing um, agriculture and some of the other food production as you've been traveling around yeah. the world? It's a good question. I, mean, I think uh, clean energy has been very good for farmers across you know, the Midwest and the Great Plains. You see farmers getting a second revenue stream from wind farms and so on mm -hmm. uh, on their land. But I think one of the real opportunities is uh, the rest of the world, the developing world, uh, has a hard time producing as much food as we do. So they don't have electricity, uh, they don't have fuel for tractors, they don't have fertilizer, and now we have companies making wind turbines uh, that turn wind power into ammonia that can be used as fertilizer uh, on field. Uh, we have electric, I've seen companies doing uh, electric or hybrid retrofits uh, for tractors that save money and save fuel and save cost. Uh, so I think there's some intersection there. I I'll add one more thing. Uh, the world, one of the drivers, the biggest driver of deforestation is cattle, but number two is biofuels. And uh, we still need to solve planes and maybe ships, but for cars, frankly, I think we should end biofuel subsidies uh, and just push on electric, and that would free up an awful lot of land to grow food for humans. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yes, please. Um, well, you, I mean, you mentioned that, I mean, I know I understand renewables create jobs. But at the same time, a lot of what you're talking about eliminates a lot of jobs, yeah. particularly for the low-end uh, income strata. And so what do you see the future of people being, having a living wage to... Yeah. It's a really good question. So there's about a quarter million jobs in the solar industry in the U.S. right now, and it's rapidly growing. And if we did a deployment of solar uh, on the scale that we need to, on net, there would be a lot more jobs created. Uh, but, but there are real challenges. If you're a coal miner and you're in Virginia, Virginia might not be the place that we build uh, the most solar. It might not be where the new jobs are created. If you're a truck driver today or a, a, you drive a car for a living, that's three million Americans, those jobs, you know, they're not all along uh, for this world. So I, I think we as a society owe it to people to give them a safety net and give them retraining for new sorts of jobs. I don't think we're headed for a lack of jobs of any sort. I think that the world, America and the world will have more and more demand for humans to do things that only humans can do. But there might be a mismatch between what somebody does today and what they, what they can do in the future, and we should help bridge that for them. Yes, sir. Wondering what, wondering what you think of um, the idea of using the wind and solar production 
using excess electricity to produce hydrogen and then uh, storing that and burning it when there's need for extra power in, in, in the plants they use now for gas yeah. rather than burning gas and also uh, possibly just producing it in large quantities and transmitting that through our gas infrastructure rather than gas. Yeah. Uh, for heat and cooking and so forth. That's a great question. So for electricity, for sort of uh, several hour storage for the day-night cycle, batteries are probably a lot cheaper for, than hydrogen. Uh, but there are parts of the world, especially Europe, where there, there can be uh, weeks in the winter where the wind is not very strong. So that's where you see a lot of the energy around uh, power to hydrogen because you can store a lot of hydrogen cheaply. And you also see places like Japan. So, you know, it's an island. It's not, it doesn't have all that much sun. Uh, they're looking to import energy in the form of hydrogen. And people are looking in Australia and Chile of uh, deploying solar where it's super sunny, making hydrogen to transport it, transport it. I think there is a chance we could use it for heating as well, though I think probably electric heat pumps uh, will end up working better, most likely. Uh, but... but it's good to have more options than fewer. Yes, sir. Um, to follow up a little bit on the, the jobs question, it, it seems like you know policy is one thing that's getting in the way of potentially moving forward because economics is no longer such an obstacle. But in terms of kind of getting people trained to work in these industries to make sure that Americans are taking you know, advantage of this growth. What what are the biggest obstacles you think in terms of of kind of moving yeah. this forward? I don't think the job training part is the obstacle. I think it's the bridge of what happens if you've lost your job as a miner or a truck driver uh, and you need time to learn the new skill. I think that's really the biggest uh, obstacle. And I think this af this affects much more than the clean energy transition, as we have changes in AI and and robotics that can take away other sorts of jobs. I think as a society, we have to think about that. How do you uh, give someone uh, uh, a landing place or a, a, a period, a bridge, to get to those new skills? I think that's the obstacle. And I think where it runs into sort of our intuitions and our, our ethos is, is a lot of perception of, oh, we shouldn't just give people handouts or support them being lazy. Uh, but I think fundamentally the world's going to change really fast and people in midlife are going to be asked to take on new skills and we owe it to them to, and we benefit from giving them a bridge to get those new skills. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, the House of Representatives has H.R. 763, which would help speed up the transition from a fossil fuel to a renewable energy-based mm -hmm. economy. And what it would do would be put a price on carbon, but it would also uh, give a dividend mm -hmm. which would return that money to households across the country. Not only would this improve environmental issues, but it would also include one topic not talked about very much so far is the side benefit is health issues. And, uh, things like asthma from fly ash of coal-fired plants in many types of tropical diseases extending further northward. I just wondered what your, uh, uh, the idea of putting a price on carbon and then returning that money to households across America like Canada is doing right now. Yeah. What's uh, your idea on that? I'm a fan of a revenue neutral carbon tax, and I, I was on the board of one in Washington State in 2016, a citizen's ballot initiative. We don't have an income tax. We did it through a reduction of the sales tax and some other things. It works really well for electricity because in electricity we have alternatives that in almost everywhere in the country are within a, a few cents. It ends up being really hard to get a carbon tax uh, high enough to really affect transportation or industry. So I think it's a, it's a good tool. Um, I think if you craft it, it can actually be quite progressive and also uh, help people at the bottom of the income ladder. Uh, but I think it's not a full solution by itself. I think you still need some policies, early stage R&D, uh, you know, mandates at the state level for the, the cement or steel we use should be more carbon free, uh, that sort of thing, along with an effective carbon price. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please. I'd like to thank you for the presentation. It was pretty cool. Thanks. Um, really eye opening. Um, on the car part, when you were showing the, like the electric frame and like the drive shafts and everything versus the gas um, 
parts in like all numerous, you know, amount of them. Um, do you think that the production of electric cars would like ma like boom a local mo more local economy than like uh, say the gas mm. um, cars? You know, you have all these parts from like China, you know, Germany, the U.S. or whatever, and they're just like all thrown in in one um, versus. It's possible. There's a company called Local Motors that really works on this. They have sort of a system where you have like standard parts you can put together into your own uh, sort of vehicle. But I still suspect that most cars are made in factories. If you make a factory, make a certain type of car, you can just be really efficient in manufacturing it, and the transportation of it is, is cheaper than the, the benefits that you get. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. It was something like six or seven years ago I heard about the compressed air car was being built in India and they had, you could go 30, 30 miles, cab drivers were using them. I haven't heard anything since, but it occurred to me if you could build a compressor that ran on, on well, solar or, or wind, that the only carbon would be building the compressor. Is there, is there anything being done with that? Yeah, the Tata Motors, which is like the big Indian uh, car company, was working on that, but they just never really got very far. And in the meantime, batteries just plunged in price. And so now uh, uh, India is going electric. Uh, India, China is the biggest electric car market in the world. Uh, the highest penetration after Norway, like 8% of, of car sales in China are electric in December. Uh, and the U.S. is actually uh, one of the next. Uh, India is kind of going from zero to 60. So now in India, there's a lot of rickshaws, like three-wheelers, and those are going electric with battery swaps. Uh, and then the fleet vehicles, uh, the ordinary four-wheel uh, passenger cars owned by uh, cities and taxi companies, they're going electric uh, gangbusters. Because they can get a 200-mile range, and that's, that's good enough for a day's driving for a taxi or a vehicle. Yeah, I took some of those rickshaws. It'd be <laughs> nice if they were batteries. Yeah, they'd be less stinky and then a little quieter as well. I actually have one comment or question that you didn't really include in, the, right, in the analysis, which is currently Wisconsin, uh, the electricity that we use and the oil that we consume, the electricity is going to mostly, like you showed, fueled by coal. That coal doesn't come from Wisconsin. We are importing it from other states. Yeah. The gasoline is not produced in Wisconsin. It's being produced. And so we're shipping money out of yep. Wisconsin. Has anybody modeled what the economic effect might be when you start doing sort of import replacement when you start saying, you know what, you're, not, you're no longer going to be shipping that yeah. money out. It cycles through the Wisconsin economy. So what does I was that thinking look about like? this before the talk. I didn't have time to do all of it. But back of the envelope, you're probably sending about 10 to $15 billion out of state. Uh, and you could reduce that to like three or four billion if you got rid of coal and uh, made your vehicles all electric. So that's, you know, $10 billion uh, savings for the state per year. Is is nothing to sneeze at. Any other questions? Oh, okay, go ahead. A couple of people coming up. <laughs> I'm going to give a, a commercial for the movie that's showing tomorrow at uh, 7 o'clock in the DUC. It's about oil pipelines and an oil pipeline break. Broke is only part of the title. It's broke the, 19, the 2015 San, uh, San, just Santa Barbara, thank you, oil spill. Uh, have you looked at oil pipe, oil transportation by pipe as opposed to things like truck and, mm. and uh, train and what the economics and safety of that are? My viewpoint is that a an oil pipeline built today uh, probably doesn't pay itself back. And, and I think that's what is uh, actually most likely to slow the creation of oil pipelines is companies seeing that they're just, the demand's going to go down, especially from Canada. Because what will ha happen with oil demand shrinks is the most expensive producers are the ones that will shut down first. And those Canadian tar sands are at the most expensive oil production in the world. So I think those tar sands are, are not going to be long for this world. They'll be some of the first uh, oil production to shut down and the pipelines from them along with it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I work, I work uh, with ASU in the School of Sustainability. And, Fantastic. Uh, and teach both energy courses. And we get a lot of information on uh, new technologies, even though we're classes are a little behind the time. But what do you what do you say about lithium ion technology and lithium air and battery technology yeah. and mining mm -hmm. problems and yeah. resource um, 
you know, degradation because of these, you know, yeah. mining practices that are taking place to... So to everything has a side effect. We've never made a technology with, with no negative effects. And so mining for the ingredients for, for batteries is challenging. Now, I think lithium is, is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is cobalt. Lithium, there's a lot of ways to produce more lithium from more parts of the world and do it more environmentally sustainably, and I, I talk to startups that are doing that. Uh, but lithium-ion batteries contain cobalt, probably three times as much value of cobalt, and all cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is neither democratic nor a republic. And it's, sort of a, it's, a, it's a human rights uh, issue as well as an environmental issue. So what you see is these battery companies are running away from that as fast as possible and are looking for ways to replace all the scarce or most toxic uh, materials. So Tesla just filed a patent last month uh, for a lithium-ion battery that has no cobalt in it. Uh, whatsoever, because they all see the writing on the wall and the problems that'll that'll happen. And by the way, uh, Tesla and most electric vehicle uh, manufacturers guarantee that end of life they will recycle the battery uh, that was in that vehicle. Uh, I've uh, worked with solar for about 30 years. All right. And I have a, a photovoltaic system here. Uh, last winter we had a 90-day period in which there was only about 12 days of sunlight. Yep. So that would seem to me that, you know, and of course it's not very windy here either. So if we were to try to make that transition, <clears throat> we would still have to back up a base load with the fossil fuel system, mm. that we couldn't get rid of that under any circumstance. Uh, and I have, I'm independent, I'm not grid tied. I have batteries. Yeah. Um, it, I see, uh, I see problems there, particularly in Wisconsin. Now, I know you talked about bringing it in, but those kinds of grids have not been produced, as you said. Uh, that's one question, but I might as well ask another one while I'm at it. Um, I, you mentioned Julian Simon yeah. when you came up here, yep. which means that your talk's going to be about economics. And uh, he was a believer that you could have never-ending exponential growth in a finite world both in population and GDP. And you seem to imply that as you talked. Mm. And you also seem to be a believer in Moore's law. Mm -hmm. uh, so I realize these questions are starting to reach out there a bit. Why don't you give me the Wisconsin response first? Uh, but, um, so going off grid is still hard. Because yeah, to go off grid, you have to have batteries or some other backup to last you your longest period of no sun. If you're in uh, Arizona or New Mexico, you can you know, go off-grid with some batteries and know that you're, you're never going to have such a period. But going off-grid in Wisconsin is, is going to be hard, and I think more people are going to connect to the grid. The grid is going to be more and more a uh, bit of a backup uh, in some cases, if you've got a big solar array in your house. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the future is grid-tied, uh, not off-grid. Going off-grid will be easier, but most people just want the lights to you know, come on 99.9 .9 or more percent of the time. So that, that's my thought on that. Uh, on the other, I, you know, I'm not a believer in uh, infinite growth, uh, but I think Simon was right on some things. Within certain constraints, uh, ingenuity, if it's properly motivated, uh, finds a way. I think Simon didn't understand the tragedy of the commons and people polluting if they weren't uh, constrained. Uh, and I, you know, when I look at population, I think population is going to grow another 35% on planet Earth uh, before it, it peaks out, just from the way birth rates are going. And I think, actually, we can handle it. I think we can produce the food and the energy and the water for it. Now, do I think it would be better if it slowed down in some parts of the world? Yeah, it would. Uh, but even with a population of 9 or 10 billion, I think we have the means to produce the food, the water, the energy, uh, to give all of those people a good life and to start restoring more of nature rather than degrading it. That, that would almost seem counter by the information that's out there because as our population grows and our GDP grows, we can see what's obviously happening with the environment. It's going down uh, exponentially in its quality. Well, in the U.S., uh, GDP and energy decoupled starting around 1970. So the average of per capita energy use in the U.S. is lower than it was in 1970, even as GDP has roughly doubled. But so the reason for that is because we've offshored all of our dirty industries. It's nope. Mm -mm. Oh, yes. yeah. I'll send you a paper. I'll give you my email. I'll send you a paper. That's maybe like 3 or 4%. Sure. Was there one last question over here? We'll make this the, the last question.
All good. You kind of covered most of it already, but I was wondering, do you think that the clean technology is going to plateau with batteries and electric and solar because of all the byproducts and making mm -hmm. batteries and whatnot? It's not really the best. Or do you think they're going to look at compressed air, hydrogen, waste products turned into energy? Or are they I just going to stay where they're at? I think we've got a variety of new things coming. I think in solar, I mean, it, in all of these areas, there's new technologies on the horizon. In solar, there's something called perovskite uh, beyond silicon. In batteries, there's dozens of new battery chemistries coming. Uh, that one that I showed you in the big uh, uh, trucks is all iron and salt. So it's a lot more environmentally benign. And I think you're going to see things like floating wind. I think we're going to see some ocean energy, at least it's being developed, geothermal. So I don't think this is the complete picture, but... But what I showed are sort of the, the, the ones that are in the lead and that we know have a chance uh, to scale globally right now. So then part of that is it's all run by economics. What's your opinion on what's the best investment if you want to invest yeah. in one of these companies? So it's, it's not all run by economics, but a, but a lot of it's run by economics. Um, I think the best investment is to not invest in fossil fuel companies. Obviously. Yeah. So I think if I got a million dollars, where do I put it? I wouldn't put it in one stock if, that's, if you got a million dollars. You know, no, seriously, there are, there are like tracking stocks in there and uh, ETFs, exchange traded funds, that are just fossil fuel free. And I think that's a, a better way than picking any one stock. Okay. Thank you all very much. It was an honor to be here. Thank you. And just one quick reminder, again, tomorrow at 12.30, back here at the Dreyfus University Center, we're going to continue this conversation about what the implications might be. I believe it's actually in the Encore Room tomorrow at 1, at 12.30. Thank you.